Hello guys and gals, and this is part four of our reading of Never Before in Paperback, Alfred Hitchcock Presents Stories Not for the Nervous. And um, we were reading River of Riches by Gerald um, Kirsch, I believe. And it's been a kind of a long... Oh, man. Gee, that's weird. Okay, never mind. Anyways, I just realized that there's only like two pages left of the story, but okay. We're going to finish that off in this one, and then we'll start the next one. Anyways, um, we're going to go over the copyright information first, because that's really important. Um, clearly says, the author gratefully acknowledges the invaluable assistance of Robert Arthur in the preparation of this volume, published by Dell, gives all that information. Copyright 1965 by Random House, gives all that information. All rights reserved, and then it gives all the different printing things. Anyways, this is going to be the acknowledgments. They'll be on the screen for a little bit. In the last book, we found out more about Jack, or, well, Pilgrim, I guess is his name, John Pilgrim, and um, about how um, he got a little bit greedy, and there was a TikTok nut, and, um, or talk day nut, something like that. And they use it to play games like down in some of the, uh, like Brazil and stuff. Really fascinating, actually. Okay. You're very obliging. I shall, it shall be returned with interest. I must go now, I said. So must I, he said he. Marveling at the intricacies of the human mind, I walked until I found myself on 6th Avenue near West 46th Street, in which area congregate those who, who, who with plying uh, or pitying smiles and a certain kind of shrug, can flaw a diamond carrot by carrot until you are ashamed you own it, and with a shake of the head depreciate a watch until it stops of its own accord. On impulse, I went into a shop there and put down Pilgrim's Nugget, asking what such a bit of gold might be worth. His reply was, You kidding? Tickle me so I'll laugh. What's the current price of, pr of printer's metal? Worth? Um, Kugel's Cure Novelties. Sell those 12... For fifty cents, mail order. I can get them for you a dollar for two dozen. A teaspoonful lead, melt it and drop it in uh, in cold water. You can honestly advertise no to alike. Um, gild them and they're a nugget, a miniature gold brick. That that manufacturer. So he puts our uh, so he puts out loaded dice for amusement only. He sells them, too. Seriously, did you buy this? I said yes and no. But as I dropped the nugget into my pocket and turned to go, the shopkeeper said, Wait a minute, mister. It's a nice imitation and a good job of plating. Maybe I might give you a couple bucks for it. Oh, no. Oh, no, you won't, I said, my suspicion aroused. I fondled the nugget in my pocket. <clears throat> it had the indescribable, authentic feel of real gold. As for that trick with melted lead and cold water, I suddenly remembered that I had played it myself about 30 years ago with some broken toy soldiers. Oh, with some broken toy soldiers. Just for the sake of playing with fire, recently melted lead has a feel all its own, and it's sharp at the edges, but my nugget felt old and worn. It could be, uh, it could be after 40 years. For once, I made a mistake, the man said. Let's take another look. But I went out and visited another shop a few doors away, one of those double-fronted establishments in the right-hand window, of which, under a sign, which says, Old Gold Bot. There lies a mess of, of, pinchback bracelets, ancient watch chains, old false teeth, and tie pins. In the other window, diamonds carefully carded and priced at anything between $2,000 and $15,000. The proprietor here looked as if he were 
if he were next door but one to the border to the bread line. I put down my nugget and said boldly, How much for this? He scrutinized the nugget, put it in a balance and weighed it, then tested it on a jeweler's a jeweler's stone with several kinds of acid. Voyage in gold, he said. Where'd you get it? A friend gave a friend gave it to me. I wish I had such friends, he called. Ivan Ivan come here a minute. And a young man came to his side. What can you make of this? Irving said, It ain't African gold. It ain't Indian gold. It ain't a Californian nugget. I say South American. Good boy, correct. How can you tell, I asked. He shrugged. You, you, you loin, he said. How do you tell the difference between salt and, and sugar? You loin. The, oh, loin, as in learn. The market value for this little bit of, of voyage in gold is about $40. I, I got to make a buck. I'll give you 35 A twenty uh, six and not a penny more, he said, counting out the money. And if your friend gives you any more, come to me with him. I took the money, caught a taxi, and hurried back to Mac to Macaroon's place. The bartender was gazing into space. The man I was sitting with, I said, Where is he? The bartender with a sardonic smile said, He put the bite on you, huh? I can smell a phony a mile off. I I didn't like the looks of him as soon as he set foot in, in, in my bar. If I, if I was you, which way did he go? I didn't notice. Soon after you left, he ordered a double, no ice, and put down a $10 bill. Left, left me 50 cents and went out. Here's my telephone number, I said. If he turns up again, call me any hour of the day or night and hold him till I get here. Here's $35 on account, another 5 when you call. But Pilgrim never came to Macaroons again. I inquired high and low, mostly low, but found no trace of him. A British-sounding man with an insinuating air, a malarial complexion, and a misleading eccentric manner who talks about the river Amazon and its tributaries. I will pay a substantial reward for information leading to his rediscovery. And that is going to finish it up for this story. And we're going to just basically go quickly into the other one. The Man with Copper Fingers by Dorothy L. Sayers. So, let's check the time here. We are doing good on time. So let's go. The Man, the man with Copper Fingers by Dorothy L. Sayers. The Egotist Club is one of the most genial places in London. It is a place of which you may go when you want to tell that odd dream you had last night or to announce what a good dentist you have discovered you can write letters there if you like and have the temperament of a and have the temperament of a Jane Austen for there is no silence for there is no silence room and it would be a breach of club manners to appear busy or absorbed when another member addresses you you must not mention golf or fish however and if the the hun Oh, if the Honorable, sorry, the Honorable Freddy um, Arbuthnot, Arbuthnot's motion is carried at the next committee meeting, and opinions so far appear very favorable, you will not be allowed to mention wireless either. As Lord Peter Whimsey said when the matter was mooted the other day in the smoking room, those are things you can talk about anywhere. Otherwise, the club is not specifically, was not um, specially exclusive. Nobody is ineligible per se, except strong, silent men. Nominees are, however, required to pass certain tests, whose nature is sufficiently indicated by the fact that a certain distinguished explorer came to grief through through accepting and smoking a powerful. Um, Trichinopoly cigar as an accomplishment in a 63 port. On the other hand, dear old Sir Roger Bunt, the 
Coster millionaire who won the 20,000 pounds ballot offered by the Sunday Shriek and used it to found his immense catering business in the Midlands, was highly commended and unanimously elected after declaring, frankly, that beer and a pipe were all that he really cared for in that way. As Lord Peter said again, nobody minds coarseness, but one must draw the line at cruelty. On this particular evening, Masterman, the Cubist poet, had brought a guest with him, a man named Varden. Varden had started life in, as a professional athlete, but a strained heart had obliged him to cut short a brilliant career and turn his handsome face and remar remarkably beautiful body to a account in the service of the, of the cinema scene. So he started out as an athlete and became... Oh, so he's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I get it. Account of the service of the cinema screen. He had come to London from Los Angeles to stimulate publicity for his great new film, Marathon, and turned out to be quite a pleasant, unspoiled person, greatly to the relief of the club, since Masterman's guests were apt to be something of a toss-up. There were only eight men, including... Varden in the brown room that evening, this with its paneled walls, shaded lamps, and heavy blue curtains was perhaps the coziest and pleasantest place, pleasantest of the small smoking rooms of which the club possessed half a dozen or so. The conversation had begun quite casually by Armstrong's relating a curious little incident which he had witnessed that afternoon at the Temple Station and Bayes had gone on to say that there was nothing to the, to the really very odd thing which had happened to him. Personally, in a thick fog one night in the Houston, the Houston Road. Sorry, these British names are kind of difficult. Masterman said that the, that the more secluded London squares teemed with subjects for a writer and instanced his own singular encounter with a weeping woman and a dead monkey. And then Judson took up the tale and narrated how in a lonely suburb late at night he had come upon the dead body of a woman stretched on the pavement with a knife in her side and a policeman standing motionless nearby. He had asked if he could do anything, but the policeman said only, oh, had only said, I wouldn't interfere if I were you, sir. She deserved what she got. Judson said he had not been able to get the incident out of his mind, and then, then Pettifer, I think, think that's how it's pronounced, P-E-T-T-I-F-E-R, Pettifer. Pettifer told them uh, a, a strange story of his own, me, uh, of his own medical practice when a totally unknown man had led him to a house in Bloomsbury, where there was a woman suffering from strychnine poisoning. The man had helped him in the most intelligent manner all night, and when the patient was out of danger, he had walked straight out of the house and never reappeared. The odd thing being that when he, Pettifer, questioned the woman, she answered the great, in great surprise that she had never seen the man in her life and had taken him to be Pettifer's assistant. Okay. That reminds me, said Varden, of something still strange that happened to me w once in New York. I've never been able to make out whether it was a madman, or a practical joke, or whether I really had a very narrow shave. This sounded promising and the guests were urged to go on with the story. Well, it really started It started ages ago, said the actor. Seven years, it must have been, just before America came into the war. I was 25 at the time, and had been in the film business a little over two years. There was a man called Eric P. Loader, pretty well known in New York at that, at that period, who would have been a very fine sculptor 
if he hadn't had more money than than was good for him. Or so I understood from the people who go in for that kind of thing. He used to exhibit a, a good deal and had a lot of one-man shows of his stuff to which the highbrow people went. He did a good many bronzes, I believe. Perhaps you know about him, Master Man. I've never seen any of his things, said the poet, but I remember some photographs in The Art of Tomorrow. Clever, but rather overripe. D didn't he go in for a lot of the... I don't know how to pronounce this word. Chris, Chris self, Chris teen stuff. Just to show he could afford to buy, just, just to show that he could pay for the materials, I suppose. Yes, that sounded very much like him, of course. And he did a lot, and he did a very slick and very ugly realistic group called L Lucina. And had the imprudence to have it cast in solid gold and stood in his front hall. Oh, that thing. Yes, yeah, simply beastly, I thought it. But then I never could see anything artistic in the idea. Realism, I suppose you'd call it. I like a picture or a statue to make you feel good of what, or what's, or what's it there for. Still, there was something very attractive about Loder. How did you come across him? Oh, yes, well, he saw me in this little picture of mine. Apollo comes to New York. Perhaps you remember it. It was my first star part. It was my first star part. About a statue that that's brought to life. One of the old gods, you know. And how he gets on in a modern city. Dear old Rubinson produced it. Now, there was a man who could put a thing through with consummate artistry. You couldn't find an atom of offense from beginning to end. It was all so tasteful, though in the first part, one didn't have anything to wear except a sort of scarf taken from the, classi from the classical statue, you know. The Belvedere? I dare say. Well, Loder wrote me and said, as a sculptor, he was interested in me because I was in good shape, and so on, and would, and would I come and pay him a visit in New York when I was when I was free so I found out about loader and decided it would be good publicity and when my contract was up and I had a bit of time to fill in I went up east and called on him he was a very de he was very decent to me and asked me to stay a few weeks with him while I was looking around he had a magnificent great house about five miles out of the city, crammed full of pictures and antiques and and so on. He was somewhere between 35 and 40, I, I should think, dark and smooth and very quick and lively in his movements. He talked very well, seemed to have been everywhere and have seen and have seen everything and not to have any too good an opinion of anybody. You could sit and listen to him for hours. He'd he'd got anecdotes about everybody, from the Pope to old Phineas E. Groot of the Chicago Ring. The only kind of story I didn't care about hearing from him was the improper sort. Now that I don't enjoy an oh, not that I don't enjoy an after dinner story, no sir. I wouldn't like you to think I was a prig. That's prig, P-R-I-G, not, not P-R-I-C-K. Um, but he'd tell it with his eyes upon you as if he suspected you of having something to do with it. I've known women to do that, and I've seen men do it to women and seen, a woman, and seen the women squirm. But he was the only man that's ever given me the feeling that feeling. Still, apart from from that, Loder was the most fascinating fellow I'd ever known. And and as I say, his house surely was beautiful, and he kept a first-class table. He liked to have everything, uh, everything of the best. There was his mistress, Maria Morano. I don't think I've ever seen anything to touch her. And when you work for the screen, you're 
apt to have a pretty exact exacting standard of female beauty. She was one of those big, slow, beautiful, moving creatures, very placid, with a slow, wide smile. We don't grow them in the States. She, she'd come from the South, had been a cabaret dancer. He said she didn't she oh he said she didn't contradict him he was very proud of her and she seemed to be devoted to him in her own fashion he'd show he'd show her off in the studio with nothing on but a fig leaf or so stand um stand her up beside one of the figures he was always doing of her and compare them point by point there was literally only one half an inch of her it seemed that was that wasn't absolutely perfect from the sculptor's point of view. The second toe of her left foot was shorter than the big than the big toe. He used to correct it, of course, in the statues. She'd listen to it all with a good natured smile. Sort of vaguely flattered, you know. Though I liked Though I think the poor girl sometimes got tired of being gloated over that way. She'd sometimes hunt, hunt me out and confide to me that what she had always hoped for was to run a restaurant of her own with a cabaret show and a great many cooks with white aprons and lots of polished electrical cookers. And then I would marry, she'd say, and have four sons and one daughter. And she told me all the names she had chosen for the family. I thought it was rather pathetic. Loder came in at the end of one of those conversations. He had a sort of grim, oh, he had a sort of grin on. So I dare say he'd overheard. I don't suppose he attached much importance to it, which shows that he never really understood the girl. I don't think he ever imagined any woman would check up the sort of life, or would chuck up the sort of life he'd accustomed her to, and if he was a bit possessive in his manner, at least he never gave her a gave oh, gave her a rival for all his talk and his ugly statues. She'd got him, and she knew it. I stayed there getting on for a month all, altogether, having a thundering good time. On two occasions, Loder had an art spasm and shut himself up in his studio to work and wouldn't let anyone in for several days on end. He, would rather, oh, he was rather given to that sort of stunt, and when it was over, we would have a party and all Loder's friends would, and hangers-on would come and have a look at the work of art. He was doing a figure of some nymph or goddess, I fancy, to be cast in silver, and Maria used to go along and sit for him apart from those times. He went about everywhere, and we saw all there was to be seen. I was fairly annoyed, I, I admit. When it came to an end, war was declared, and I'd made up my mind to join up. When that happened, my heart put me out of the running for trench service, but I counted on getting some sort of a job which, um, with perseverance, so I packed up and went off. I wouldn't have believed a loader would have been so genuinely sorry to say goodbye to me. He said over and over again that we'd meet again soon. However, I did get a job with the hospital people and was sent over to Europe. And it wasn't till 1920 that I saw Loder again. He'd written to me before, but I'd been, but I'd had two big pictures to make in 19, and it couldn't be done. However, in 20, I found myself back in New York doing publicity for the Passion Street, and got a note from Loder begging me to stay with him and saying he wanted me to sit for him. Well, that was advertisement, and he'd, and he'd pay for himself, you knew, you know, so I agreed. I had accepted an, an engagement to go, go out with Mistofilms Limited in F 
fake of dead man's bush. The dwarf men picture, you know, taken to the spot among the Australian bushmen. I wired them that I would join them at Sydney the third week in, in April and took my bags out to loaders. Well, we are going to have to... Um, stop that here. We might be able to finish this in the next time. We have been reading from Alfred Hitchcock Presents Stories Not for the Nervous and specifically The Man with the Copper Fingers by Dorothy L. Sayers. And um, so yeah, I really do enjoy this book and if you enjoy it too, then make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all the information will be in the description below along with a link to the Discord server. Thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.